You're listening to Radio Free Satan. Enjoy the show. I would like, if I may, to take you on a strange journey. Welcome to another episode of Nine Cents. Nine Cents is a satanic perspective of our modern world, and I, as always, am your host, Adam Campbell. It is great to have you. It is February 19th, and I've got a great show for you this week. Before we start the show, um, today I was brewing. I homebrew, I, I do something associated with homebrewing every week. Uh, when you brew a new batch of beer, essentially you have, you know, one and a half weeks, two weeks, that you're still dealing with that first batch of beer, whether it's uh, checking specific gravity, uh, siphoning the secondaries, or just filtering, and um, bottling or kegging. So it's not just this sort of one-time process where, you know, one day you just spend, you brew a batch and, you know, it's all done. Uh, It takes a little bit of time. And I've been doing this for a long time, and today was the first day that I actually emptied out uh, a batch that had already been bottled of Pilsner because it was contaminated. I'm pretty sure now it was because of uh, having um, not clean equipment when I did that batch, and it, it had like this yeasty, funky smell to it. And it pisses me off because it was a Pilsner, my favorite type of beer that I brew. Uh, and it was... Uh, a Pilsner is an amazing tasting beer, certainly when you homebrew it. And when I smelt <laughs> this particular beer, and I actually tried to drink it a couple times, and I just could not get past that first sip because it, it was bad. I mean you know, like when you taste and smell it, that it's bad. You know, it, it's just this funk that's associated with it that just sort of lingers in your mouth. Really gross. And so it, I, today I was taking the 50 bottles that I had and just popping them one at a time, emptying it down the drain, cleaning out the bottles one at a time. And in the distance I heard Taps music playing. <laughs> Inside, I was crying. <laughs> just depressed that I had to throw away this batch of really what normally is delicious beer. Uh, I mean, after I I had bottled that batch, I had gone to great lengths to make sure I cleaned everything 100%. And that just goes to tell you that whenever you brew, cleanliness is the most important thing to anything else. Beer will come out well, even if you brew it too long, too short, uh, Whatever you do, it'll come out drinkable unless it's contaminated. Unless there's some alien bacteria in it, then you are screwed and you just wasted six or seven weeks of your life. (laughs) And then you're never going to get back. And, you know, 40 or 30 or 40 bucks in the process. Uh, Anyway, so today I brewed amber ale and we had also cooked up a batch of honeymead. Normally, I like to try to get honey from my sisters, who both actually have their own beehives in their backyard that they harvest for honey every year. But this year, I just sort of got tired of waiting, and uh, we went to our local grocery store, which actually stocks local honey from other um, honey farmers. I don't know what you call honey people. (laughs) Uh, Human bees. (laughs) Uh, So we sat down and we did this. And the time it takes to cook up a batch of honeymead initially, just to put the ingredients together initially, is not a tenth of the time it takes to brew a batch of beer. But honeymead is like wine in that it takes months before you ever even bring it to your lips. Whereas beer, you've got like six weeks and you're drinking it. So, you know, it's one of those things where if you don't have cleanliness... With your beer, well, you know what, really, realistically, two weeks from the time you brew it, you're going to know. And it's just whether or not you want to waste the time bottling it or not. Uh, with with Honeymead, it's going to be months, like 
two and a half months before you find out if it's good or not. And then months after that before you even want to try it, and really years if you want it to you know, be nice and aged or anything. Though, maybe this is just me personally, I don't really subscribe to the uh, year quality lines that you would with wine, for example, when it comes to meat. Uh, this is not that... It's not as delicate. It's really like this dessert, you know, flavored wine drink. So it's not really, I don't know, maybe that's just me. Uh, anyway, yesterday my family had went out of town uh, to allow me the opportunity to spend the entire day devoted solely to recording music. And I had uh, some I had some trouble with this because the night before I was drinking my American Ice, which is, uh, if you're familiar with Ice House, it's a lot like that. It's a high alcohol content beer. You know, that's a relative term. So in Utah, 3.5 is sort of the average percent of alcohol in a beer, which is terrible. When you homebrew, you're closer to 4 or 5%. Ice House is like a 6 or 7%. So it's a lot stronger than, you know, the regular beer that I make. Um, I had had a few of them, and it it really sort of knocked me on my ass earlier than I had wanted to be, and so I woke up just all stuffy and stuff, as if I'd been drinking wine, because that's what wine does to me too, if I drink it in abundance, and (laughs) if you're trying to sing, and you have a cold, uh, it's really nasal, it's not really, it's it's not 100%, so I literally spent 30 or 40 takes on two tracks, two different tracks, so maybe 60 takes throughout the entire day, and I'm still not happy with where it is. And I think a lot of that has to do with you are your worst critic, um, but I, I like to think that I can look at what I do objectively, and even though I'm the one doing it, see the flaw. It's just one of those satanic traits I picked up um, <laughs> along the way. So I don't bullshit myself very often, but I'm also not that traditional artist who always cries about their work because it's just never good enough or or I'm just in so much pain. Shut up. So I can objectively look at what I do and tell, okay, well, it's okay for the quality that I normally do, but it's not up to par to what I want or not up to par with what I'm trying to achieve. So, you know, you get to a point where you're like, should I even bother doing this anymore? And though... I cannot say whether or not I will be doing anything in the future. I can say that the tracks that I had recorded, I'll be working on to try to get them out with some of the other Black House Blues music. Um, Just because, you know, those other artists that I'm collaborating with are producing amazing work. So I don't want to insult them by putting out a subpar product. Uh, And I do want to get music out there, but not at the sake of quality and... Um, what I think would end up being uh, a result that would, in the future, look kindly on its participants. You know what I mean? So, I don't know. Um, it, it's just one of those things where I'm just not really... I'm, I'm not 100% on as of yet, but, you know, as the pro- project develops, um, we'll, we'll see what happens. I've been watching a lot of movies um, this weekend... I think I watched like three or four of them this weekend, which is not normal for me. Uh, I watched the new version of The Thing. I watched uh, Paranormal Activity 3, and I went back to a good oldie of mine, which is um, Sunshine, which, if you've never seen it, you must. It's it's an amazing show. Uh, I don't let you look it up for any information on that, and I actually might review it in, in a future show, so I'm not going to go into detail about it here. But watching specifically Paranormal Activity 3 just really made me think of how Satanism is portrayed in movies. And so I want to maybe talk for a couple minutes about it in This Devil's Advocate. So in This Devil's Advocate, we're going to be talking about Satanism lies in film. In Infernal Informant, I have two articles. Santorum defends comments on Obama and education. And UN nuke inspectors leave for key talks in Tehran. In the Creature Feature segment, I last week talked to Infernal Records, and I'm going to be bringing that interview to you. Uh, it's a good one. Brett is a very uh, cordial man, a, a gentleman, and uh, it was really a pleasure talking with him. 
And if we have time, and I suspect we will, in Bizarre the Bizarre, I'm going to be talking about uh, hugs. Man hugs and woman hugs and uh, what you can do to liven them up a bit. One thing specifically. Don't try it with your mom, though. (laughs) And uh, that's going to be it for the show. Sit back, hold tight. Another fantastic episode of Nine Cents begins now. Why bother? How you done? Great. Let's cut the bullshit and get real. Why this purity you feel about evil? For Christ's sake, why? It don't lie to me. I guess, Father. You gotta feel that old nick in your soul. And it becomes clear. Like it did for me, the first time. That's when I realized my one true calling in life. No, what's that? Shit, man. <laughs> I'm a born devil's advocate. Welcome to the devil's advocate. I'm a Satanist. I'm a member of the Church of Satan. But I do not speak for the Church of Satan. That is all. One of the first ways I was personally exposed to the idea of Satanism or evil or devils or devil worship or anything like that was through cinema, through film. Um, And it was one of those things where every time you would see a a horror film or um, a suspense film where they wanted to portray the ultimate evil. There would be, like, an upside-down star, or there would be some version of the Sigil of Baphomet. uh, Always ever-present. And though that was honestly one of the first ways I was exposed to it, and maybe not just me, but a lot of other people as well, and for me personally, it led me to understanding what Satanism was and actually seeing myself in it. It was that notion initially that it was anti-Christianity. So it was a lie. It was presented in a way that was not true at all. And it wasn't supposed to be. It was never purporting to be legitimate Satanism or anything like that. But much like with any intellectual property, active use, active continual use, means that it's yours. So, for the Sigil of Baphomet, specifically the Church of Satan's version, it is registered and copyrighted, and these that are shown in movies and in album art cover are not the exact replicas of it, so there's nothing that can be done. It still reflects negatively on Satanism, and it's sort of part of that cycle of satanic lies associating devil worship with Satanism associating. Um, and that's really where all of these ideas come from. I mean, not just the satanic panic era of the uh, late 70s and 80s, but also the fact that it's continuing in modern culture, in the cinema, and on TV shows. When I saw, and there, this is not strictly satanic, when I saw the Wolf's Hook make a debut on True Blood, I was infuriated. Because I did not, I have it on my wrist, and I I have had it on my wrist since I was first exposed to it uh, in my early research of the Church of Satan uh, back in the late '90s, and th- I don't want to be associated with any True Blood werewolf weird fanatic people. I mean, I enjoy the show, but I I don't want to be looked on as a fanboy because of that. So you know, we are directly affected by the way that the media projects or represents symbols that we use and that are really center and core to our values as Satanists. That's maddening. And this all started because I was watching Paranormal Activity 3. And the entire show, 
up until maybe the last seven, ten minutes was your traditional, regular paranormal activity type of show. And then in the last... I don't want to do any spoilers here for anyone that hasn't seen it because I do think it's an entertaining show up until that very end point. But you do run across where the the sigil of Baphomet is on, like, hand-drawn really poorly on the wall. And there's a couple things that bother me about this. One, let's say that you are a, a devil worshiper or some sort of confused witch, as it is in this movie. Wouldn't you want to put a, a well-constructed whatever symbol on your wall as decoration. I mean, if you're going to go to the trouble of having something on your wall, why would you want it to look bad? And it's almost as if having it drawn poorly adds to that authenticity of dirty, vile devil worshipper that they're trying to get across. And I could maybe understand that if it was like a bunch of children, but in in this film specifically, it it was adults. Um, And they always add it in, you know, a sort of accompanying other symbology, which I don't have any problem with. You know, if you want to grab some old archaic symbols of long dead cultures and throw them up there because of their obscurity and with the atmosphere they're attributed to devil worshiper, I don't care. I'm not a devil worshiper. That's none of my damn business. And, you know, I can actually understand that they would do something like that. But it's like taking a cross and associating with Islam. It's not the same thing. I mean, they're both uh, sort of right-hand paths that people follow, um, flawed in very similar ways. But it's not the same thing equating devil worshippers with Satanism, Um one believes in a Christian ideology and the other believes in human influence and individual power. You know, one is giving away power to spiritual entities and the other is generating power and influence in their own lives. It's not the same thing at all. It's completely different and it's just crazy that we're associating these things. And I would also like to think that because I was raised in a way where that confused notion uh, was projected onto me. And that's actually why I started looking in that, because I was rebelling against my parents in the first place. What if it wasn't there? Would I still have found my way to what I am as a Satanist? Would I still have traveled that path and ended up where I am? I'm not entirely sure that I would have. And, and that's not to say that it's a negative thing um, having it. it. It's infuriating because you have to do sort of some backpedaling explanation. And any time there's not like a cut and dry explanation when you're talking to someone or it's delivered in a cut and dry manner, they think you're lying. <laughs> and any time you associate yourself with Satan or the devil, you're automatically to a lot of Judeo-Islamic Christians <laughs> a liar off the bat. So, you, you know, that's one of those reasons why the Church of Satan always um, purports not to go out proselytizing and not to go out explaining yourself. And um, there are, you know, individual reasons you might want to uh, explain to people, but it's not something that we go out of our way to, you know, debunk or, or dispel or anything. Um, well, anyway, my point was, would we as individuals have found Satanism and really, through finding it, realized who we were, you know, being able to put a name to what we were, if it wasn't misrepresented out there? And it's an interesting question. I mean, I don't think that there's a right or wrong answer. I think it's one of those things where, individually, you have to evaluate it, and it's frustrating when you when you associate yourself, and you and have been wearing the name Satanist for over a decade, and you're seeing stuff like this, and it's being interpreted incorrectly or presented incorrectly as just blatantly lies and very juvenile um, and really non-professional as well. <laughs> but without it, I don't know. I don't know that I ever would have found who I really was. I, I, I certainly would have still had the same ideals, but I don't know that I would have made that same journey to become I-Satanist. You know what I mean? 
Interesting thing to think about. If we were not misrepresented in the media, would we still have found our way to Satanist? Think about it. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to the Infernal Informant. Listen up, listen up. Okay, y'all about it. Good news. There's no devil. Bad news. Hell's no heaven. There's nothing to see. I'm your Infernal Informant. All right, this first article is the New York Times, posted uh, February 19th, 2012. Santorum defends comments on Obama and education. Rick Santorum on Sunday tried to clarify his comment that President Obama subscribed to a phony theology, saying he was referring not to the president's faith, but to his view of man's relationship to the world. It was during a campaign stop in Ohio on Saturday that Mr. Santorum described what he called the phony theology theology of Mr. Obama's agenda. Quote, it's about some phony ideal, some phony theology. Oh, not a theological based on the Bible, a different theology, he said, but no less a theology. It sounds to me like someone who doesn't know the fuck they're talking about. On Sunday, Robert Gibbs, a political advisor to President Obama, criticized such attacks on character and faith. I can't help but think that those remarks are well over the line. It's wrong, it's destructive, Mr. Gibbs said on the ABC News program this week, adding that it reflected the nastiness, divisiveness, ugliness, and distortions of a hard-fought Republican nominating process. Mr. Santorum, at another appearance on Saturday in Columbus, Ohio, called the ideas of schools being run by the federal government or by state governments anachronistic. Mr. Santorum did not say public schools were a bad idea, and he said that there was a role for government help in education. Where did they come up that public education and bigger education bureaucracies was the rule in America, he said. Parents educate their children because it's their responsibility to educate their children. Yes, the government can help, Mr. Santorum added, but the idea that the, that the state government should be running schools is anachronistic. It goes back to the time of industrialization of America, when people came off the farms, where they did homeschool or had the little neighborhood school, and into these big factories. So we built equal factories called public schools. And while these factories, as we all know in Ohio and Pennsylvania, have fundamentally changed, the factory school has not. Asked about those remarks on CBS News program Face the Nation, Mr. Santorum, who, with his wife, has homeschooled their children, remained adamant on Sunday. While he said he did not oppose government financing of schools, Mr. Santorum said that public education should be a dynamic process that's locally run. I think the parents should be in charge, he added, working with the local school district to try to design an educational environment for each child that optimizes their potential. Mr. Santorum also defended his criticism of a requirement in the president's health care policy that insurance companies to cover prenatal testing. He had said earlier that the policy was included to save money because free prenatal testing ends in more abortions and therefore less care has to be done because we call the ranks of the disabled in our society. All right, that really bothers me. Uh, let me pause here for a second. I'm going to address two things. Uh, first... Uh, this real quick um, prenatal testing ends in more abortions. He's making some bold assumptions here. And that's that because you can test to find out if your baby is healthy or if you're pregnant means that you will automatically have an abortion. And both of those cases are a lie. Certainly there's a percentage, but in our society it's not a big one. So just because you can test your fetus uh, its, its health or that you can test to see if you have uh, a fetus growing inside of you does not equate murdering uh, a fetus. Okay, so let's take that bullshit out of it for a second. More to the point, what happens, as if that's like a, a money saver, what happens after they're born? I mean, if the mother is not ready to be a parent... If the father is not ready to take care of the child, then it's two children taking care of a child. In which case, they're going to be living in poverty because they are not financially or even emotionally prepared to, to, to take care of a child. So, what's the alternative? Either they are born as poor parents and forced to take care of a child that they don't want, or they give it up to adoption. And what happens to adopted children? 
because we have adoption agencies full of children that are not wanted by anyone. We have people going outside of our own country adopting children because the adoption process that we have is ridiculous and way too strict. Now, without getting into details about our adoption processes, let's just say that a lot of children go through life without parents because of adoption and because of this idea that you should not ever, no matter what, have abortions, uh, e even if it's incest in Santorum's position, which is insane. Uh, okay, so you have these children who no one wants, who know no one wants, because obviously they don't have parents, and they're living life as criminals because that's the worldview that they've been given. They've been told that no one wants them, no one wants anything to do with them, so they are outsiders in a very negative way. And how many people come back from that position as healthy, active citizens? I would argue not many. And I would also argue that our criminal system ends up being the adopted parent. So the taxpayers are picking up that burden of parents. Is, does that not cost a lot of money, Santorum? That doesn't make sense to me. So instead of having loving parents be with a wanted child, we are having a government institution, prisons or state institution, taking care of them. That doesn't make sense to me. But I'm not a Christian like uh, Santorum here, so maybe my math is off. Uh, more to that. Let's talk a little bit about... Uh, this education thing that he's talking about. Now, I agree, and I've actually stood up for the, the argument that our school systems were meant to teach people to exist and work effectively in an industrial situation, and that's not where we are anymore. So I agree that we need to uh, work on our education systems. And though I would like to think that we could effectively do that as a state or as a city, a, a local community group, what we end up with is localized ignorance. Meaning, they only think that what is important is immediately around them. They only see their worldview as it pertains to where they live. So suddenly people aren't being taught about American history. They're not being taught about actual, factual history. They're being taught reconstructed history based around Christian ideals or Baptist or Protestant ideals and suddenly we live in a world that's full of ignorance and bigotry that's locally constructed and I have a problem with that the whole point of the internet and, and having a world view is that you're not isolated to your local environment you see perspectives from Iran you see perspectives from China you get this large, vast world view that is not localized and contained in a little bubble. Now, homeschooling is not always bad. I, I agree with that. I, I actually have some friends that are running homeschooling very poorly, and so I see firsthand how bad the education can be. And then I hear, anecdotally, about people who have had a good experience, though I've never met someone who has been homeschooled, who has admitted to being homeschooled, who has ended up socially educated, and uh, just uh, traditionally educated. It's always one or the other, let's say. So I think there is definitely a place in our world for private and public schools. I'm fine with private schools as long as they're given the same advantage and the same financial zone as public schools. Because what you do is you end up classifying students um, by their parents' tax bracket, essentially. And so you end up with classes of education, which I think is a genuine problem because I, again, see this worldview. Everyone should have the same educational opportunities because that's how we're going to advance as a culture, as, as a human culture, not this weird localized, I don't know, hillbilly farm that we're going to end up doing if we have things uh, Mr. Santorum's way. Okay, so that was my rant. Let's get back to this here. The former Pennsylvania senator has a three-year-old daughter, Bella, with a serious chromosomal disorder. 
And he said that doctors who detect such a condition before birth typically recommend abortion. Asked whether he was suggesting that Mr. Obama lacked sympathy for the disabled, Mr. Santorum did not back down, saying, I think the president has a very bad record on the issue of abortion and children who are disabled. One of Santorum's rivals for the Republican nomination, Representative Ron Paul of Texas, scoffed at Mr. Santorum on Sunday for focusing on social issues like abortion and contraception, and for believing that he could defeat Mr. Obama. <laughs> Ron Paul, I agree. Well, I don't see how that's possible, Mr. Paul said on CNN program State of the Union. This whole idea about talking about the social issues and who is going to pay for birth control pills, Mr. Paul said. I'm worried about undermining our civil liberties, the constant wars going on, the debt of $16 trillion. And they're worried about birth control pills? I, I have to tell you, I'm a little bit mixed on Ron Paul. I love him as an individual who focuses on a larger worldview and not so much on the personal like uh, Santorum and his ridiculous birth control arguments but what I don't like the idea of is this sort of every man for himself legislative ideology he has I, I certainly believe that our current incarnation of government is much more invasive than potentially it needs to be all right but just stripping it all away like ron paul suggests i think leads to a position of anarchy and confusion in a society as aged as we are i think what we need to do is slowly release these boundaries that the government has put in place and i certainly believe when it comes to corporation when it comes to education, and when it comes to general health and welfare of the society, well, that's a government role, because that's what we've given, we've created the government for. Protection of the society, whether that is foreign or domestic. So, as long as it's working within the best interest, and not, and, and this is really just sort of fantasy land I'm talking, because when human motivation and money get in the mix, then corruption breeds it, it's like a bacteria uh, under heat it, it just it, it grows and grows and and that's really what we have right now is this sort of money corrupt um, corporate power in our society i don't know that we'll ever get away from it and you know what playing a little devil's advocate right now i'm not sure we'd be better without it you know this idea of this utopia of where everyone just pleases themselves and everything's wonderful well it's a good idea but it's never worked in the past so why would it work now especially with the ignorance that abounds in our current incarnation of society what if we didn't have our public education what if we didn't have uh the internet because it was just a porn factory and the christians shut it down well if we don't have the spread of information that just leads us right back to puritanical rule and you know one can argue that that's a drastic step and i would say not so much uh ignorance is as powerful as education and information is sparse so we need to ensure that we continually have a means for us as individuals to excel to succeed at that American dream, which is the whole point of our country, the second that that goes away, we lose who we are, and we lose the potential for a good future. And that good future is being able to live in our own isolated environments as we see fit without the interruption of outsiders, to be as successful or as unsuccessful as we desire. And that's not what we have right now. We're close. We're actually really close to it, but we're not quite there. Anyway, if Mr. Santorum gets into office, which is really, I mean, we'd have to be hit by a meteor and only, like, Alabama left uh, as a voting populace. But l let's just say argumentatively, if uh, Santorum gets into office, we have a hell of a problem on our hands. Not just as sameness, but as human beings, as Americans. Uh, let's move on to the next article, because I've been uh, railing on this for a long time here. <laughs> This is CBS News World. UN nuke inspectors leave for key talks in Tehran. Associated Press Vienna. A senior UN nuclear official said Sunday he hopes for progress in upcoming talks with Iran about suspected secret work in atomic arms, but his careful choice of words suggests a little expectation that the meeting would be successful. The comments by Herman Nackertz, 
as his International Atomic Energy Agency team prepared to leave for Tehran for the second time in less than a month, appeared to reflect IAEA reluctance to raise hopes that Iran will engage on an issue that it claims has no substance. Before the trip, senior diplomat told the Associated Press that Russia and China, strategic and economic partners which Iran traditionally relies on to blunt Western pressure over its nuclear activities, were urging Tehran to cooperate with the IAEA team. Moscow and Beijing are using some pretty high-level diplomacy to persuade Iran, said one of the diplomats, who asked for anonymity in exchange for discussing confidential information coming from his capital. Still, hopes were slim. A previous IAEA mission returned from Tehran in February 1 without managing to dent Iran's wall of denial. In comments to reporters at Vienna Airport, Nakertz was at pains to avoid raising hopes. Quote, Importantly, we hope that we can have some concrete result after this trip, and the highest priority remains, of course, the possible military dimensions of Iran's nuclear program, he said. This is, of course, a very complex issue that may take a while, but we hope it will be constructive. Iran has refused to discuss the alleged weapons experiments for nearly four years, saying they are based on fabricated documents provided by a few arrogant countries, a phrase authorities in Iran often use to refer to the U.S. and its allies. Faced with Iranian denial, the IAEA summarized its body of information in November in a 13-page document drawing on 1,000 pages of intelligence. It stated that for the first time, the sum of the alleged experiments can have no other purpose than developing nuclear weapons. The IAEA team wants to talk to key Iranian scientists suspected of working on the weapons program. They also hope to break down opposition to the plans to inspect documents related to nuclear work and secure commitments from Iranian authorities to allow future visits. But before the trip, senior diplomats told the AP that Iran had made no commitments, despite the Russian and Chinese attempts at persuasion and rapidly growing series of international sanctions threatening to choke Iran's oil lifeline and financial system. The most recent squeeze in Iran was announced Friday, when SWIFT, a financial clearinghouse used by virtually every country and major corporation in the world, agreed to shut out the Islamic Republic from its network. Tehran remained defiant Sunday, announcing its halted oil shipments to Britain and France in an apparent preemptive blow against European Union after the bloc imposed sanctions on Iran's crucial fuel, fuel efforts. I wonder why they didn't shut down the American shipments. <laughs> Could it be because we're the number one oil consuming country? <laughs> it would be too much of a, a personal blow to their individual pocketbooks. Even though we're the one country they really want to shut down shipment to? Uh, at the same time, it appeared eager to show its, it was ready to talk. Even before receiving an answer on its offer last week to meet with world powers on its nuclear program, Foreign Minister Al-Akbar Saleh on Sunday set Istanbul, Turkey, as the venue for those negotiations. Beyond concerns about the purported weapons work, Washington and its allies want Iran to halt uranium enrichment, which they believe could eventually lead to weapons-grade material and the production of nuclear weapons. Iran says its program is for peaceful purposes, generating electricity and producing medical radioisotopes to treat cancer patients. Its activities at its plant at Fordo near the holy city of Qom, are of particular concern because it is dug into a mountain and possibly impervious to attack, an option that both Israel and the United States refuse to rule out should diplomatic persuasion and sanctions fail to stop Tehran's nuclear drive. Reflecting growing jitters that the Israelis are poised to strike, both U.S. and Britain on Sunday urged Israel not to attack Iran's nuclear program. The U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff General Martin Dempsey and British Foreign Minister William Haig said an Israeli attack on Iran would have grave consequences for the entire region and urged Israel to give international sanctions against Iran more time to work. Dempsey said an Israeli attack was not prudent, and Haig said it would not be a wise thing. In interviews Friday and Saturday, diplomats told the AP that Iran is poised to install thousands of new generation centrifuges at the cavernous facility, machines that can produce enriched uranium much more quickly and efficiently than its present equipment. 
While saying that the electrical circuitry, piping, and support equipment for the new centrifuges was now in place, the diplomats emphasized that Tehran had not started installing the new machines and could not say whether it was planning to. Still, the senior diplomats who asked for anonymity, because the information was privileged, suggested that Tehran would have little reason to prepare the ground for the better centrifuges unless it planned to operate them. That's the end of the article. And that makes perfect sense. Why would you build the infrastructure for something if you had no intentions of installing and using that something, in this case centrifuges, uh, to uh, produce enriched uranium? I mean, it makes no sense. Now, I have mentioned Iran in the past on this show, and I had always said that I do not see them as a dramatic threat because of their history. They have never started a war. They do backhanded deals and they support, but everyone does that. So we can't really hold that to term when it comes to an all-out war. However, they've never had a nuclear weapon arsenal before. And if these are true, these uh, accusations, and they do really have that facility, uh, well, then they probably already have military weapons. I mean, realistically. Unless they're pulling, like, a Saddam Hussein uh, bloviating your, uh, your capacity stand. I mean... You know, he didn't have anything compared to what uh, pre-Iraq War I, uh, the Desert Storm, Desert Shield conflict, that he said he did. And if that's what Iran is doing, well, it makes sense. I mean, they're really being focused on now, and with everything that's going around them in the uh, uh, Arabian world, I would be really worried as, as a, a totalitarian regime as well. Uh, I, I gotta say... Uh, militant Islam, it's really on the decline. So, if, if that was what I was, I would be a little bit worried. So I understand why, if they are bloviating their capacity, why they would do that. But also, what it does is focus everyone much more on them, rather than having us back off. It's sort of this mentality of stepping up to the schoolyard bully in a chance to... Uh, you know, stare him down, then he'll just back off. But guess what? We are the schoolhouse bully, and we have never backed down. Uh, well, okay, I say that, but <laughs> Vietnam. Uh, so, outside of that, <laughs> we have never backed down. To our own detriment, we have never backed down. So, Iran, please, don't be fucking stupid. <laughs> Assuming they listen to my show as if I'm talking to them directly. <laughs> Uh, look, don't be dumb. Seriously. If you have it, okay, fine. We have nuclear weapons too. I don't necessarily care about that. They're trying to become players in the world stage. They've always sort of been backseat players. Now they want to sort of step up now they have the opportunity. Fine, I don't care about that. But let them come in and prove that's what they're doing. If you're going to make an economic stand, well then do it. Make an economic stand. But this pussyfooting around it, is just going to get you in deeper shit on the world stage. You know, you you need to shit or get off the pot, essentially. So, that's, uh, that's my perspective here. <laughs> I'm going to skip the break. We're going to dive right into Creature Feature right now. Oh, God. No. Just me. <laughs> Did you know that after the heart stops beating, the brain can function for well over seven minutes. We got six more minutes to play. <coughs> Why are you screaming when I haven't even cut you yet? Welcome to Creature Feature. Welcome to another Creature Feature. Today I'm being joined by Brett J. Burford. We're going to be talking about Infernal Records and a little bit about what's going to be coming on the horizon. Pretty exciting stuff, got to tell you. Uh, Brett, thank you so much for joining me. How are you tonight? I am very well. Thank you very much for having me, Adam. It's an absolute pleasure. And I guess it's not really tonight for you. Uh, I, I appreciate your willingness to work around the time differences, and they are quite different. Uh, being in uh, Australia and working with uh, a lot of people from the U.S., I've had to get used to that, so that's quite okay. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so I, I certainly want to focus today on Infernal Records. Uh, I have a little personal interest vested in this conversation, but more to the point, uh, I want to talk, I, I want to find out how it evolved from, you know, some of the earlier 
incarnations uh, into this. Uh, but before we do, as with every interview I do, can you tell me a little bit about yourself? Okay. Uh, well, I'm 35 years old and based in Adelaide, Australia. My background, uh, as far as professional background, is in web technology, project management, uh, entrepreneurship, and, and business management in general. Uh, one of my big interests is study. I believe in furthering oneself throughout one's life. Here I've, uh, I've got multiple postgraduate degrees in business-related fields. So fields I'm studying more at the moment, and some of these studies include psychology, which is a personal interest as well. Nice. I, I think, I, and I can't really speak to um, outside of U.S. cultures, but it, it certainly seems like America has a hard time with the idea of uh, personal advancement. And if you are, I don't know, in, in a good enough family that forces you to go through high school, to get to college is, is like pulling teeth in some families. <laughs> and so I, I always have this, uh, I don't know, just, just personal uh, respect for those who go above and beyond. An associate's degree is, puh, that's like high school. Uh, a bachelor's degree, meh, you know, that's what I got. Eh, I could do better. Uh, <laughs> people who go for their doctorates or multiple uh, degrees, I think, uh, I have the greatest respect for. Uh, I think there's a lot to say about life experience over book education, but I also think that it is essential to know as a species where you come from, and, and you don't get that through life experience. Uh, without a doubt, and as you've just touched on, I think it's essential to know where you want to go, and then you need to plan how do you get there, mm -hmm. and education is the way to do that. Now, Australia is quite similar to the US in many ways. We do have, you know, a lot of people that do go to university, but, you know, people seem to be, have the attitude that education is something you get out of the way as quickly as you can, and then you get on with real life. Now, I, I did things a little uh, backwards compared to most people. I initially, I, I left school not knowing what I wanted to do, uh, and I didn't go to university. I went straight into the workforce, straight into IT, and was progressing just through the passion I had for my work. At one point, I decided that you know, that was enough. It was time to you know, do something more. And I applied for a postgraduate scholarship, which technically I was not eligible for, not having a bachelor's degree. I managed to win that scholarship, and that was paid for by the premier of the state I live in, and a premier is the equivalent title of a governor. Yeah. So so I managed to, from no bachelor's degree, get in and study a Master of Entrepreneurship, which I f just thought was fantastic. Oh, yeah. and, that gave, and that gave me my inroads to study further and study uh, a Master of Project Management, and then that's moving on to international relations and applied finance. And I've just used that opportunity to, well, now I'm actually going back and starting a bachelor's degree on the side, <laughs> out of interest. But I do tend to do things backwards, so also my wife would say. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. Uh, however you get there, as long as you get there, I think that's great. Okay, so how about Satanism? Uh, when did you first realize, or maybe when were you first exposed to what Satanism was, and when did you first identify yourself? Uh, well, it was uh, obviously through my teens I heard about Satanism. I knew who uh, Dr. LeVay was. But it's not something I actively looked into to see, you know, what it was about. It was maybe seven years ago. I started with a trip to Melbourne Zoo, funnily enough. Uh, I knew that there was a bookshop in Melbourne called The Haunted Bookshop. I'd heard it was fantastic. I had to check it out. And they had this uh, bookshelf dedicated to Satanism, which I thought was fantastic, especially in hindsight. I, of course, picked up the Satanic Bible, took it home back to Adelaide, and again, as most people tend to, they feel that they wrote it themselves. I, uh, you know, I guess that I found a, a label for how I had been thinking throughout my life, and along with that label, uh, I guess a, a philosophy that I could I could look at and learn from and apply to my life to further myself again, which is. I think the huge benefit for me. So, and, and I, I think it was not too long after that that I decided to join 
the Church of Sidon as well. Nice. Well, let me ask you something. Were you already interested in, uh, I guess, just the occult in general? I mean, was there? Did you have any background with that? Uh, no background specifically. I've always had that minor interest in, uh, I think, a- anything that was in opposition to Christianity. I did go to a Christian school uh, yeah. for my secondary education. Uh, they did not appreciate me for some reason. <laughs> I, I can't imagine why. Uh, you it can was, smell it. <laughs> it. Well, they they started getting concerned with me when I uh, wanted to do artworks of uh, Ozzy Osbourne and the like, and they considered that Manti was evil. So uh, it, was, it was in year 12, funnily enough, that they uh, actually did ask me to leave right just before the end of the year. So, <laughs> what? Yeah, they, they said, we do not want you here. And I said, I do not want to be here. Let's up. call it a day. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so I started my education off needing to uh, do Year 12 a second time. And I managed to get into a non-religious school for doing that and haven't looked back since. <laughs> wow. I had no idea. I, I, I think I take for granted that um, there is this insane religious compulsion in America that I I just assume isn't anywhere else. Uh, so that's it's nice to well, know we're not the only ones. Well, we, we do have it to some extent, uh, but again, we, we spoke about those cultural differences before and yeah. uh, we don't seem to have the uh, some of the fanatics that you manage to have in the US. And to give you an example, just recently uh, with my wife, we saw some uh, street preachers just down talking about Jesus, yelling it out, enforcing it on everyone. (laughs) Now, here, something I don't think I'd see very often in the US, people were abusing the preachers. Oh, no! People here don't want, a lot of people do not want to tolerate that. They don't want religion forced down their throat. We think oh, that, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we think that uh, the freedom of choice is exactly that, and it's a freedom of choice to choose what I hear as well. And uh, I guess that's why apparently uh, religion is dying in Australia and we are becoming more atheistic over time, which I'm quite uh, happy about. Yeah. Holy shit. Ding dong. This is dead. <laughs> That's great. Uh, yeah, I mean, the only time that we ever had... I, I was in the military for a while, and I was uh, in um, South Carolina. I was in Georgia. And we had a lot of, like, uh, wandering uh, Baptists. Uh, they got shouted down pretty decently in in the military barracks where I was. But, you know, for the most men, everyone just like, oh, well, you know, they're going to do what they're going to do, and... That's yeah. the problem, is that the complacency. Well, they don't have to. So maybe we could uh, take uh, notes from Australia there. All right, so you said a couple years later you joined the Church of Satan. Let me ask you why. The, at the time I joined, I was not really in contact with anyone uh, from the Church of Satan. I saw it as purely something that was, uh, it was to benefit myself in that I saw uh, that I was acknowledging something that is important to me. The satanic bubble was very important to me. It immediately had a big impact upon my life, and by joining was my chance to acknowledge that to myself, no one else. And, yeah, that's that's what led me to join. Nice. Was there ever any issue with, well, it's, you know, it started over in San Francisco and California, it's on the other side of the freaking planet... Uh, I mean, was there ever like a distance, a disconnect feel factor for you? Uh, only once I started to, I guess, converse with other members. A lot of members being in the, the US, certainly members that I've been uh, in contact with, I would feel a level of disconnect. But uh, I see that as something very separate from why I decided to join. Right. Uh, um, but I think that any anyone, when they are, I guess, segregated from that group which they are wanting to be part of uh, or people they're wanting to converse with, they're going to feel some level of distance. Yeah. Okay, well, let's transition a little bit here to Infernal Records if we can. Um, what was the impetus for Infernal Records? 
the driving force for Infernal Records is is the artists. The, there are a lot of talented musicians out there and some great musicians that are COS members. That is what has inspired me to create Infernal Records and to get their music out there. My goal is to share their music with the world and aid the artists in finding opportunities that they may not otherwise have. Uh, I mean, we'd mentioned off mic earlier that, you know, you're sort of an entrepreneur of sorts. Uh, is this, I mean, do you have like a passion for this that sort of supersedes just the business aspect of helping promote those that share an ideology that you share uh, and that may be talented? I mean, is, is there is there anything else to it that... The, the, I think I pr- probably did have the idea or interest of a label you know, many years ago when I worked on various music projects and uh, and web technologies in regards to independent music. But I think that there, there, there certainly is that shared passion for the, the Church of Satan, for the ideology that we hold. And uh, again, if, if I didn't like the music that I was hearing, I would not have the interest in doing this. Yeah. It is... It is because I think there are some really talented folk and it's also easy for people to get lost when it comes to marketing themselves in, in the independent music mm. uh, arena. So uh, I, I would still say that the driving force is the artists themselves and that's the main passion and having that entrepreneurial drive certainly has helped get me that, uh, get that running. Let me ask you a question, and this is something that I, I think would be a, a challenging situation to find yourself in. Uh, let's say y- you meet someone, they share your ideologies, uh, uh, they're interested in your business aspects, they send you some music, they say, I want you to represent me. Uh, on an individual basis, you're 100% with them, but you listen to the music and it is ass. It is just pure shit. What do you do in a situation like that? Well, that's where I have to be rather tactful and I would try to positively point them in another direction. <laughs> I might be pointing them towards uh, finding an alternative means to develop their music. I, I wouldn't turn them away and say, get lost, don't want to know you. Mm-hmm. I'd say, okay, your, your music may not be at the stage it needs to be at where you can really look at uh you know, making a go of it, getting it out there. And I guess it also depends on the musician's goals as well. Some musicians just want to get their music out there and that's what they want. It doesn't matter how many people will make, you know, uh, be interested in buying their CD. So it, it does depend. But if someone's wanting to get their music out there, they think the music is a lot better than it really is, well, I'd say I would offer them the opportunity of perhaps working with them to create a better product and see if there is a solution. I'm, I'm a big advocate of honesty, and in some cases it hurts, but it's it aids everyone in the long run. Absolutely. Nice. Who are some of the musicians you've had the pleasure of working with? Well, apart from the ones known to your listeners, most have been uh, local to Australia. And I think the two that I would go out of my way to mention, there is a rock band with a bit of a punk influence called Toxic Shock from Adelaide. Um, They played for a number of years and their music was a huge inspiration to me as well. Um, They were very well aware of my beliefs, didn't share them, doesn't matter, they weren't Mm -hmm. judgmental. Um, I worked with them uh, for a while, helped them in, in regards to their uh, final CD release, and you know, I think they were just fantastic. And the other person, um, she, I think she's one of the most talented musicians I've probably ever come across. Uh, her name's Casey right. Marie Allen. She's unreleased at this time, but she's working on an album. I've been working with Casey for a number of years. Her music is something that I would consider it a crime to not share it with the world. Uh, so she's certainly been an inspiration to me in that respect, and you know, she just plays solo acoustic guitar, singing over the top, and it's just fantastic. Whoa, well, uh, shoot out an, uh, a URL or something. Uh, I'll certainly uh, uh, be uh, getting some of her music up on uh, Infernal Records, oh, okay. uh, and it'll probably be a demo uh, over the coming uh, month or so, and then 
after that, uh, we're looking at getting our CD out there and released. Tell me about Black House Tribute Records. Okay, well, Black House Tribute Records uh, started off uh, through Chris Mentor. Now, he started a, a project, as most people will be aware of, uh, the tribute to Anton LaVey. Mm-hmm. Um, that CD, uh, when he was in the process of creating that, um, that's when I started working with him and we decided to start a record label and see where that can go from there. I think it was a fantastic idea and it was good to see it finally get out there and since that time, Chris and I parted ways and he's retained the full control of the project and he's also moved on to some other great things in his musical career and things that I wish him the best with. What was that process like? I mean, was that your first exposure to um, uh, producing an album? As far as a compilation goes, yes, and I realised that there were some very challenging things to come across when you've got a project that so many parties are having input with and they are scattered across the globe mm-hmm. you're always going to have problems uh, in regards to coordinating those activities i was lucky in that chris had a lot of that already managed and he did a great job with that um so i, I think i came in at the tail end of of that process so i saw some of the difficulties but was able to let chris handle that was there anything that you were, um, maybe that stood out that, that you learned from, from that experience? Uh, without a doubt. I'd say that, well, first of all, when it comes to marketing a collaboration, a compilation like that, at first we believed it would be a great marketing point that it was Church of Satan only member musicians. Mm-hmm. But it did seem to be somewhat of a barrier and it created um, a lot of problems for us when we did look at avenues of marketing. A lot of people, they like the the name, the term Satan, but when it comes to really dealing with folk that are tied in with the Church of Satan, that's another matter. I think the other thing that was more of a personal learning experience for me was uh, about communication and that's whether it be with the artists to collaborate on such a project uh, and a learning experience in communicating with my business partner it's easy for the process to break down and then troubles surely follow Mm -hmm. I think it's really important to ensure with any project like this that everyone is on the same page and so you have to take that action to ensure that that is the case so when you talk about everyone being on the same page, um, I mean, at, at what point do the the artists' um, voice in the compilation end, and the producers of the albums' voice um, maintain weight? I mean, do you allow an artist to say, "Well, I want to be after this other artist," or "I want to be featured here instead of here," or "I want you to promote me"? Or, I mean, do you ever see sort of that grandstanding? No, we certainly didn't. Uh, as far as uh, I certainly saw, everyone was very professional to deal with. Thankfully, there was not any uh, any problems in that regard. Uh, we saw it, and I still see it today as a with a compilation, artists will provide um, the track that they're for, or for the compilation. They provide information such as a biography, any photos they want associated with that. And then at that point, they just need to know what the terms of the agreement would be as far as the distribution, as far as the marketing, as far as royalties. They need to understand exactly what things are at that point and then it becomes the choice of the people putting that CD together to work out the track listing, the artwork and and coordinate that. Otherwise you'll have that uh, problem of too many chiefs, too little Indians. Yeah. I mean, that album was tribute to Anton LaVey. With that phrase, I mean, there's there's a certain amount of authority that's expected from the audience, one, um, certainly for the contributors uh, in, in the creation of, of their individual tracks. What about you as a producer? I mean, I, Anton LaVey has, I mean, he's sort of like, uh, he's, 
he he's he's more than uh, a name at this point. I mean, he's the founder of the Church of Satan. He has uh, elevated himself to sort of a legend in uh, virtually the entire world. You can't go anywhere without someone, even in the most remotest of communication with the rest of the world, having some sort of an idea uh, what he means, uh, what he did, uh, you know, who he is. So mm-hmm. with with a personality like that and, and tacking that on to a project, was there an intimidation factor in creating it? I mean, did you fear that you wouldn't be able to live up to the, I don't know, the expectation. I, th- I think that uh, it would it would be a natural worry to to have. Um, but when I heard the music that was being contributed, the the worry factor for me was certainly was there no more. You know, we we you know, both Chris and myself thought that the compilation was a fantastic collection of music, and it was what we thought to be a fitting tribute, and. You know, we would certainly stand by that as being a being just that. Let's talk a little bit about follow up albums. So Tribute to Anton LaVey from Black House Tribute Records is actually still available on Amazon. Um, it's still available on uh, iTunes. Uh, what what about what's gonna come after that? Okay, well will there be a follow up? It's a yes and no answer. The, the tribute album, being that it was Chris Mentor's baby, his project, I don't feel it would be right for me to directly follow that up. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want that to, to ensure that that remains his legacy. Uh, a compilation you know, that, that is being put together at the moment, uh, it's not specifically a tribute album in the sense of what was released, but it will be Church of Satan members only on there. And we're going to make it a, a little less obvious that it is a COS member compilation in the ho- hopes of further market penetration. Uh, so as far as it being a follow-up, you know, we consider that it, it is a tribute in the sense that it is COS members only, but we're not outwardly marketing it as such. Uh, i got to tell you, when I first heard about this, uh, I, was, I was really excited um, I was first introduced to, and this may sound a little naive, to the idea of uh, media marketed specifically to other Satanists um, by Kevin Eislauter. Uh And maybe it, it just was never, I never really thought about it. I, I always imagined when, when, when a Satanist creates uh, music or writing or a piece of art, you're doing it because of an internal passion, and you just want to put it out into the world. It was never directly for other specific demographic of Satanists to enjoy. So when I heard that another version of this was released, because I actually didn't, when the original, um, well, I, I, I shouldn't say the original, when when Tribute to Anton LaVey was released, I, I wasn't aware of it. When I heard that there was going to be a follow-up to it, I was incredibly excited uh, not only to hear the original music that these contributors are going to be putting out there, but also the opportunity to maybe even throw my hand in the ring and, and, and see if you know I could be a part of it. Um, what made you use? I mean, we talked already that you know it wouldn't feel right to use uh, someone else's uh, IP with Black House Tribute Records. Uh, we talked about how Infernal Records is your way of getting. Uh, um, musicians out there, some COS specific, and in fact, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, some of the people that you're going to be getting out there have nothing to do with the Church of Satan or Satanism. Well, certainly um, down the track, I expect that some of the artists that will be on the label, that, like you said, they will have nothing to do with Satanism. Um, I, I see this as a, a vehicle for primarily for COS members to have uh, get their market out there further than those they directly associate with. But it, in doing that, we need to create it in a way that it really is a marketable entity. By you, If we continue to use uh, the black house or the, that type of imagery mm-hmm. for the label, we really would you know, shut off a large part 
of the market. And, you know, while some, like you said, some members, they just want to create and that's all they're wanting to do and that's all well and fine. There are other artists that will want to go further than that and I hope this can be a vehicle for that. So that's why I, I think that we started with uh, Infernal Records specifically and, uh, yeah, quite confident in that direction. Oh, yeah. So is there any way I can... Uh pull out of you uh, expected, anticipated hope uh, release date <laughs> I'm going to yeah, pass on that one for now um, but what I, what I will add uh, is that in this new direction for the label and in calling it Infernal Records we're hoping to associate a lot more with the film industry and start getting artists exposed to TV movies and that type of thing so you know with with some fingers crossed and some hard work maybe we'll uh, have some sex success with that oh yeah all right what about other people that are coming up in the music scene what about other artists or maybe producers who want to compile their own albums do you have any advice for them uh certainly now the thing that i would say is most important is to not expect that the hard work is actually the creation of the music the hard work is in the promotion. It's ensuring that the world can find you uh, amongst the vast ocean of other musicians out there. Yeah. I think it's, it's so important to consider unique ways uh, that you can promote yourself, your craft. Uh, you, you really need to use your understanding of lesser magic to get yourself that audience, and then you have to keep them. And that's something that a lot of musicians miss. They put their music out there, they assume that, like Field of Dreams, they will come. Well, they will not. Uh, and that's something that, you know, I've seen people do time and time again, and it is a big mistake. You, you need to put a lot of time and effort into that marketing aspect if you want to have people find you, and then you need a quality product to back it up, of course. But as far as it you know, comes to advice, I think that is the most important thing that someone can take away. Oh yeah, and, and it's. I mean, I I think it might be able to be broken down into a nice little uh, phrase here. Hard work pays off. It, it seems to be an increasing um, deficit in our cultures, you know, the, uh, the people of the world that they feel like everything should just come to them. They don't have to work for anything. It, it's sad, and, and I know no Satanists would adhere to that, but. It's nice to hear when people go out of their way to bring it up. You have to work for what you get. <laughs> uh, you're dead right. I think that you know a, a saying that I think summarizes everything for me is: uh, the harder I work, the luckier I get, and right. that is what it's that, that's what it's about. And unfortunately, one problem that I think musicians have is people that are very creative can sometimes. Um, be so focused on that creativity that they don't use uh, the logical side and work out a plan for marketing their music. They're just so focused on the one aspect, and that's something that uh, you know. I'd, I guess that I'd like to uh, see change by you know by myself helping people if I'm able to help them get those plans in order, get their music out there. That's where I see my place is. Oh yeah. And and that is sort of one of those things where if you are solely focused on the creation and the, the expression, I mean, you're just ignorant to the marketing. I mean, to be quite honest, you have to study to know anything about marketing. So that's that, that's a perfect fit for, for someone like you and, and for a business like yours, Infernal Records. Where can people reach you in order to reach out? Uh, the best way to reach me is through the website infernalrecords.com. Uh, it's about to be uh, relaunched with some more information about the upcoming release. Uh, all my contact information will be on there, and I welcome anyone to contact me at any time. Any chance for a uh, timeline on uh, when that's going to be up? That's going to be just in the probably three to four days maximum. Nice. What can we expect from you in the future? Ooh, uh, well, apart from Infernal Records, the other main project I'm working on is with my very, very talented wife, Molly. 
Uh, we're working on a project called uh, Hellhound Jewelry. It's a new business which is going to release high quality jewelry. Oh, uh, yes. the, f- the first release that we're working on, um, I'm very, very excited about, and that's a really wonderful Baphomet medallion designed by Les Hernandez. He's done a sensational job. He's one of those people that not only is a fant- he a fantastic artist, but boy, is he proactive. Uh, and you know, he's one of those inspirational people I spoke to you of. Yeah. Uh, he's done a, a fantastic design, and I think people are going to be really excited to see what, what's coming when that's well, released. Yeah, I'm, I'm a fan of his music. Uh, I know him personally. I've, I've had the pleasure of meeting him and collaborating with him. Uh, and I've actually seen prototypes of, of what you're speaking to. So that's really, really exciting. Where can people go to find more about that, uh, about your uh, Hellhound? Is it Hellhound jewelry? That, that's correct. Uh, they will in- initially be able to get updates through the Hellhound jewelry Facebook page. Okay. And a website is being developed at the moment. Don't have an ETA for that at present. Uh, but... Yeah, we're, we're, we're working more so on getting that uh, medallion ready for release. But when that's out, it will be noted through the Facebook page first. Nice. And are you openly accepting uh, other uh, requests or submissions? Uh, I, well, when I, say, I wouldn't say openly. It's something that people, if they do have submissions, they can certainly approach us with. But what it comes down to, is it going to sell... Mm-hmm. Is it going to be? Is it going to be something that people want? And you know what Les put to us, we were blown away by. And uh, you know, other than that, it'd be a you know per project basis. Nice. Uh, well, that's 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 as far as uh, I should say. That's as far as um, where something's going into production for a lot of people. If people are wanting a a one-off something just for themselves, then that's certainly a different case, and we can help them out. Okay. And how can they contact you for that? Just uh, the Facebook page? The Facebook page is the best place right now. All right. So uh, get on Facebook and uh, search up Hellhound Jewelry, people. Uh, Brett, thank you so much for joining me. I I truly do appreciate it. Uh, I got to tell you, man, the the first time we started contacting, I knew you were going to be one of those uh, uh, great gentlemen to talk with, uh, really pleasant uh, not abrasive at all <laughs> and this interview has proven that I, I appreciate your time thank you so much for joining me and I hope to uh, you know maybe uh, talk with you further when uh, other projects arise we uh, certainly will I look forward to that Adam thank you very much for having me fantastic well until then hail Satan hail Satan <laughs> It's the bizarre of the bizarre. Two weeks in a row. It's like I'm on the lamb. I'm like on a bender. Two weeks of bizarre of the bizarre. Alright, this week I want to talk to you about hugging. Yeah, we all hug. I actually start. <laughs> I, it was weird. I, I did some time in Germany with the military, and the women there are big huggers. At least the women I was exposed to. Uh, friendly, not like sexual or, I don't know, weird. I mean, it was just, you know, hello, you know, a really quick, not even like a full arm around hug. It was more of like, you'd like grab the shoulder and like kiss the cheek hug. Um, and so I, I, was, I made a decision at some point. I said, okay. For my close friends, I'm going to do the hug, and I'm going to see how it's uh, how it's accepted. So I started moving in on the hug, and it starts as like a little like handshake. Me and my close friends from high school and, and after had sort of developed our own little like handshake thing that I assume everyone else has too. It's not like all complicated like sitcoms in the '80s or anything, but you know, it's it's like a little handshake, like bro hug thing. Uh, and I started moving in. And taking my time. And that's always like a weird thing whenever you're hugging someone else, when you take time on the hug. And certainly when you're hugging another man. So it sort of just became like this funny thing for me personally to do. And I I never really said anything about it to anyone else. But I, I would just like play in my head like, I wonder how long they would let me just hug them. You know, you just, like, move it. Nothing weird. I'm, I'm not, like, grinding up against them or anything. But just, like, you know, you, it starts with a handshake. You move in, one hand behind the back, and you stay there. 
for like half a second or a second or two seconds you know and see how long it takes them to push away a little bit entertaining there what i want to talk to you today give me a little background there (laughs) and you have to know the person to do this or else there could be dire consequences like you know knuckles in your face uh moving your hips in (laughs) <laughs> when you're hugging let's say for argument's sake you have some friends that you do a quick bro hug you know and bro hugs are usually like 15 seconds max you know you move in not even 15 seconds that's a long time one one thousand two one thousand three one th- i mean that's a long time so like maybe two one thousand count is like the length of a hug one one thousand two one thousand and that's like a long hug right let's say you move in for three seconds and you just angle you know, like, like like you're fucking or something. Angle your pelvis in just a little bit. Not a lot, just a little bit so that they know that's what you did. They know that you intentionally pushed your junk up against them. What would they do? <laughs> I mean, it's not a sexual thing because you're not trying to really, like, hump them or anything. But it, it's more of like a social experiment. In the name of science! <laughs> your hip in just a little bit they will know it won't take much they will notice and because you don't have to do it much you don't have to like overexert yourself looking like an asshole to everyone else in the room it's interesting because then they just hold them there so they have to stay there for a two two one thousand second count rather than the quick like hey how's it going pat pat and you back away pat pat one thousand two one thousand and a little penis touch (laughs) Right? I mean, it's one of those things where it relatively completely meaningless on its own. Like, you accidentally are moving through a plane and your junk will touch more strangers than an entire year intentionally. But, because this is such an intimate thing like a hug with someone that you know well, they're going to notice. And just their reaction is going to be fantastic. And the best possible reaction? No reaction. They're just going to internalize what just happened. And it's going to be similar to as if you were a grandparent and they were hugging you. Completely asexual, nothing to do with nothing, but suddenly the grandparent decided to touch you a little bit. You know, so it's like wrong, you're friends, you shouldn't have done that, but it happened. How do you deal with it? Uh, It might be a little interesting experiment to try. So, next time you give a hug to whomever... You know what, for, for awkwardness sake, don't do this to a family member. But outside of that, if you are inclined to do the bro hug, if you're a man or a woman, the cheek kiss hug, move in. Add a half a second or a second. And touch. <laughs> See what happens. Who knows, it could end up in some magical sexual experience. <laughs> or, at the very minimum... A slap in the face. (laughs) Either way, a success as far as experiments go. (laughs) Or maybe not. Either way, that's going to do it for yet another show. I hope you enjoyed it. I would love to hear from you. Visit the website 9centspodcast.com and send your correspondence to info at 9centspodcast.com. Let me know of any suggestions, critiques, corrections, or general comments you might have. You can visit the SatanNet, Facebook, Google+, Twitter, and MySpace page for 9 cents and get updated on weekly topics. Listen to the show at RadioFreeSatan.com or download the show Monday nights via my RSS feed found at 9centspodcast.com. You can also subscribe via iTunes by searching 9 cents. And don't forget to leave a rating and a comment. If you'd like to learn more about the Church of Satan, visit ChurchOfSatan.com. Dot com. And if you'd like to hear other fine satanic voices, music, or personalities, visit RadioFreeSatan.com, an online streaming radio station. Once again, thank you for joining me, and as always, I'm your host, Adam Campbell, and until next week, Hail Satan! <laughs>